It was December 4th, 1940. Frank and Bessie Gilmore, along with their 10-month-old son, Frank Jr., were drifting through Texas. Bessie was nine months pregnant. She went into labor. Frank pulled over in a small oil worker's town where Bessie gave birth to their second son, Faye Robert Kaufman. Kaufman was just one of many aliases that Frank Gilmore used to throw people off his trail. He was a so-called 100 percenter. He sold ads to non-existent magazines and kept 100 percent of the profits for himself. Bessie was appalled that Frank had named their son Faye, so two weeks later as they resumed their aimless trek, Bessie changed the baby's name to Gary Mark Gilmore. The next eight years proved to be hard ones for the Gilmore family. They moved from town to town. Bessie had a third son, Galen. Frank was abusive, drank too much, and often wound up in prison. When Gary turned eight, Bessie forced Frank to settle down in Portland, Oregon, where he sobered up and created a legitimate publication called the Building Code Digest. He traveled frequently on business, a good thing for Gary and his brothers, because when he was around, they never knew what to expect. The children got beaten frequently for no reason or what he considered a, a good reason. Sometimes he would even sneak up behind them and hide behind the door when they came in and just attack them for, for no real reason. Frank's beatings varied from spanking to hard blows with razor straps, belts, and sometimes clenched fists. Bessie wasn't immune from Frank's rage either. He often beat her in front of the kids. But above all, it was Gary who suffered the most from his father's physical and verbal abuse. There was something in Gary that reminded my father, I think, of disappointments in his own past, and I think reminded him of, uh, of, his, of his own rage. Gary, Gary received a good deal more of my father's anger than any other person in the family. In 1951, when Gary was 11, a fourth son, Michael, was born. Soon after, they moved again to Salt Lake City. There, Gary became involved with a group of neighborhood thugs. They introduced him to cigarettes, alcohol, and shoplifting, and he was hooked. After only a year, the family moved back to Portland, and Gary began spending much of his time at nearby Johnson Creek. At the tender age of 12, Gary was already getting drunk and playing hooky from Joseph Lane grade school, where he was known as a delinquent with a hatred of authority. The people I taught with who had known him felt that he was volatile and would have easily exploded if anybody had pushed him, so they didn't. They didn't push him to do his homework or anything else. They just, uh, you know, let him sit in his desk and do what he wanted to do, and which is what he did. Gary loved the attention he got from being rebellious. He liked to impress friends with his bravado. One of his favorite stunts was to stand in the middle of a railroad bridge with a train barreling down the tracks. Just seconds before being crushed to death, Gary would run to the end of the bridge and jump to safety. At age 14, he dropped out of ninth grade at Franklin High School and hitchhiked to Texas with his parents' permission. They thought the trip would do him good, let him sow his wild oats. Gary only stayed in Texas a few weeks. He ran an illegal poker game and used his winnings to buy sex, alcohol, and drugs. The thrill soon wore off and he returned to Portland where he started a car theft ring. In May 1955, he was caught and his father came to his aid, hiring an attorney for his delinquent son. Gary got off with a warning from the judge. A pattern was beginning that would repeat itself each time Gary got on the wrong side of the law. It is true that my father went to great lengths to keep Gary out of jail. I really have to wonder if there was a, a part of my father that you know, that couldn't help but feel sorry for his children and what he had done to them. And, and, and perhaps in some ways that was the part of my father that also loved Gary and wanted to protect him. No matter what he did, if he stole something, he'd go to court and he says, my boy didn't do it. There's no way you can prove he did it. And usually he got away with it. If anything, his father's help taught Gary how to manipulate the legal system, but not how to stay out of trouble. Two weeks later, he was arrested again for stealing a 1948 Chevy, and this time there was nothing that his dad could do. 
Gary was committed to McLaren's Reform School for Boys in Woodburn, Oregon, where he spent 15 months, most of it in maximum security. A common punishment was for them to be stripped of their clothes and locked in an attic room that had broken windows uh, in, inside a, a cage, uh, sometimes in the middle of winter, spend two or three days in, in that room. A lot of the kids who were in that room would take broken glass and sort of carve themselves, make little tattoos on, on their hands. Gary was released from McLaren in January 1956. He spent the next two years in and out of jail. In later years, he would look back on this period of his life and come to two conclusions, that he wasn't determined enough to be a successful thief, and that he had quit caring about anything and was completely adrift. In 1958, he was picked up for statutory rape. His father helped to get the charges dropped, but Gary was sentenced to a year on an old car theft charge and sent to the Oregon State Correctional Institution in Salem, Oregon. In mid-1960, the girl he had raped gave birth. Gary's parents told him falsely that the child had died. He would never learn the truth. And that wasn't the only secret his parents kept from him. It was in prison that the issue of his birth certificate surfaced. Prison officials could only find records for Faye Robert Kaufman, and neither Frank nor Bessie cared to explain the discrepancy. So Gary began to doubt that Frank was his real father. He really wondered, where did he come from? I think it was kind of a torturous thing for him to not know where he began. He didn't know where he was going either, evidently. <laughs> he was written up for 23 disciplinary violations, and time was added to a sentence for bad behavior. In the fall of 1961, Gary was released from prison and went to live with his parents in suburban Portland. But he wouldn't be home very long. It was only a matter of months before he was back in jail, this time for having an open bottle of liquor in his car and for driving without a license. While he was serving his time at the Rocky Butte Jail, his father died of cancer. Gary went berserk. He tore his cell apart and slashed his wrist with a broken light bulb. He was thrown in solitary confinement and prohibited from going to the funeral. Gary's half-hearted suicide attempt was only one of many that would occur while he was behind bars. I always thought that these were not sincere suicide attempts, that on those occasions when he would cut his wrist, that he would not cut his wrist so deeply that he really uh, threatened his life. By the time he was released, the 21-year-old Gary Gilmore had become a more hardened criminal, but not necessarily a smarter one. He and a friend were soon arrested for using a lead pipe to rob a man of only $11. Gary could now add assault to his already impressive rap sheet. Prosecutors saw a repeat offender with an unwillingness to rehabilitate himself. They argued he was a danger to society. The judge agreed. In March 1964, Gary was sentenced to 15 years at Oregon State Penitentiary a severe prison term that year after year would fill Gary Gilmore with rage, rage against the world and himself, enough rage to turn him into a killer. It was a hostile 24-year-old Gary Gilmore who entered the Oregon State Penitentiary in 1964. He was violent, suicidal, and more disruptive than ever before. He was a warden's nightmare. He is like the bad dream of every prison administrator. He's going to break all the rules. He is going to defy authority. He will assault people. He will use drugs, drink alcohol, anything he can get his hands on. And he uh, was truly an antisocial personality. Gary found life in prison unbearable. The constant racket and the lights glaring 24 hours a day were driving him mad, an experience about which Gilmore would later reminisce on tape. It's noisy. You're subjected to all kinds of shit you don't want to hear and be a part of. And ringing bells, hollering, get up, get up, or we'll come in and take your bedding and all that shit. He said it was like walking up to the edge of hell and looking over and maintaining your balance as well as you can. He told me one time in one of his letters that the only affordable emotion that you have when you're in prison is anger. Gary's anger found its outlet in a constant litany of complaints, mostly about his dental care. Shortly after his arrival at prison, his rotten teeth were pulled, but the dentures given to him never seemed to fit. 
It became his personal crusade. He even assaulted dentists. He carried it to an extreme that I've never seen with anybody else. Uh, that was his cause, and, and you know he rallied around that. And this went on for, for months and months and months. They don't fit. They don't work right. Uh, he used to break them, flush them down the toilet. He tried everything. Hunger strikes, and I think he cut on himself uh, more than once. The prison put Gary in its version of solitary confinement, the disciplinary segregation unit, 23 hours a day alone in a cell with one hour to exercise and shower. Gary was a frequent visitor. It was in segregation that another side of Gary Gilmore emerged. He began writing poetry, drawing, and educating himself in the humanities, art, and literature. His IQ was 130. I think he found a kind of solace in, in solitary. For all that he did to be the big, hard convict, I think solitary was actually sort of his comfort. He found himself removed from all that threat and, uh, and all that sort of ongoing horror. But not even solitary confinement could silence Gary Gilmore. He continued his fight for new dentures, even going so far as to convince a group of inmates to enter into a suicide pact in protest. They all slit their wrists at the same time. Some came close to dying. Gary only scratched himself. The prison had had enough of Gary Gilmore. In 1970, he was admitted to the psychiatric unit. It was decided that an antipsychotic drug called prolixin would be administered, a drug with often painful and humiliating side effects. The thing that we saw was this shuffling, slurring, uh, inept, uh, drooling. It was a nightmare. And from Bessie's point of view, I think it was more than a nightmare. Tell me about being paralyzed, not even being able to unzip his pants to take a pee, not being able to, to move. At the urging of Gary's mother, the prison finally took Gary off prolixin, but with the end of one source of pain, another soon took its place. In 1971, Gary's younger brother Galen died during surgery at the age of 27. But for once, instead of reacting violently, Gary immersed himself in his artwork, cultivating his natural artistic talent by working in the prison art shop and winning several contests. As a result of his artistic success, Gary was granted a rare chance to make something of his life. He was released from prison to attend art school at a community college. But as he had done many times before, Gary threw away his chance. He robbed a gas station at gunpoint. He was immediately arrested and taken to the Multnomah County Jail. A couple of days later, in another failed suicide attempt, he slashed his arm and stomach. In February 1973, Gary was sentenced to nine more years and returned to Oregon State Penitentiary, where he became increasingly more violent towards prison guards. Officials decided to put Gary back on prolixin, the drug that had turned him into a virtual zombie three years earlier. He begged for an alternative punishment and got it. Gary was transferred to Marion, Illinois, a maximum security federal penitentiary better equipped to handle disorderly inmates. But he wouldn't be there very long. He started writing on a regular basis to his cousin Brenda in Provo, Utah, expressing regret for all the time and freedom he had lost in prison. A year and a half later, a deal was struck to parole him into her custody. In April 1976, Gary flew to Salt Lake City. Brenda met him at the airport. He carried everything he owned in one small athletic bag. I thought that was sad after all those years. To put your whole life into a bag smaller than a grocery bag it seemed to be quite a loss. And Gary was missing more than material possessions. After spending almost half his life behind bars, he lacked the skills needed to adapt to life on the outside. He was impatient and became easily frustrated. His uncle Vern tried to help. He gave Gary a job at his shoe repair shop, but Gary was easily distracted. 
Every girl that walked in, he'd whistle at them, you know, and everything else. I had to talk to him every day. You don't do that. He said, well, did you see? Yeah, I seen it. But you don't follow it, you don't chase it, you don't whistle. He didn't like that at all. It wasn't long before he saw one girl he just couldn't resist, Nicole Barrett, a 19-year-old mother of two children who had been married and divorced three times. The attraction was mutual, immediate, and overwhelming. Within a week, Gary had moved into Nicole's home in Spanish Fork, a small town near Provo. Gary was like a teenager with his first real crush. We just started having a lot of fun together. Just the littlest things were meaningful. It's like this person has just started living. And everything was, everything was new and everything was was an experience, it was fun. Gary and Nicole drank heavily and smoked marijuana. Gary's cousin Brenda worried that Nicole, who was half Gary's age, was a bad influence on him. She thought Gary's blind love could only lead to trouble. It was almost like an old sailor out there on the sea that's been out there way too long, and he hears the sirens call of the mermaid and whatever out there on the ocean. And I think when Gary got back to society again, and when he saw this girl, Nicole, it was like a siren call to him. It was coaxing him in closer and closer. But if you've ever heard any sea stories, you know that it's right by the reef. In fact, a collision was coming. A combination of headache medication and excessive drinking caused Gary to suffer from violent mood swings and sexual dysfunction. His drinking is, is what really messed him up. He just changed like somebody who, uh, Never really expected to be free. More like an escape convict, you know, than somebody out on par parole. He just felt like he was just gonna live it up and do whatever the hell he wanted to do. Including shoplifting, Gary would steal beer, cigarettes, and anything else that caught his eye, even guns. In late June, he brought a bag of stolen guns into Nicole's house. It scared the hell out of me. It felt like, you know, the beginning of the end. He was just running into too many walls, and he was going to lose it. And I didn't think he would go peacefully. I thought he would do something really crazy this time. Nicole did what was probably the smart uh, and reasonable thing to do, which is that she left Gary. The 35-year-old Gary Gilmore was devastated, and all the anger of his prison years boiled up to the surface. A week later, Gary's blind passion for Nicole would unleash itself as blind rage. The result would be deadly. After two months of a passionate but troubled relationship with Gary Gilmore, Nicole Barrett left him and moved out of the house. It was an act for which Gary's life experience had left him hopelessly unprepared. He spent a week looking for her to no avail. Gary was becoming more and more unhinged. He truly loved her and needed her and had to have her. And I think it was the last possible loss that he felt his heart could, could stand. On the evening of July 19, 1976, Gary drove within a block of the Sinclair service station in Orem, Utah, just outside Provo. He parked his truck and walked toward the station. It looked deserted, except for Max Jensen, a 24-year-old Mormon law student and father of an infant girl. Gary had one of his stolen guns with him, a 22 caliber automatic. He approached Jensen and demanded the money in his pocket and the coin changer around his waist. He led Jensen to the small bathroom near the office, put the gun to Jensen's head and made him get down on his knees. Then, according to Gary, he pulled the trigger once, saying, this one's for me. As he pulled the trigger a second time, he said, this one is for Nicole. He left a wad of bills untouched on the counter in the office. The following night, Gary dropped his truck off at a repair shop in Provo and walked to the city center motel. I think in some ways, he had always wanted to destroy something in the world. And, uh, and I think he didn't feel particularly discerning about what it was or who it was that he was going to 
destroyed. Tonight, it would be Ben Bushnell, a 25-year-old Mormon with a pregnant wife and baby boy. Gary entered the hotel office carrying his gun. He approached Bushnell, demanded the cash box, and then shot him once in the head. As Gary ran out, he reached under a bush to dispose of the gun. The pistol went off, sending a bullet in one side of his hand and out the other. Dazed and bleeding, he drove to a friend's house and called his cousin Brenda, asking her to bring him bandages and painkillers. But instead, Brenda called the police. I didn't know what Gary would do. He shot someone Monday, someone Tuesday, and it was Wednesday. We had to stop him. Gary was arrested and taken to the hospital to have his hand bandaged. Later that night, Lieutenant Gerald Nielsen interrogated Gary, recording part of the conversation on tape. Gary denied any involvement in the killing and asked Nielsen to check out his alibi. That's what happened. I know you don't believe it. I really don't. I really don't. I really don't. I think you did. I can't understand why, why you know, they're shooting people. I killed anybody. I didn't. I didn't have to tell you. I didn't. I didn't have to live. I went back and talked to him and said, hey, your alibi's full of holes. People didn't confirm your story. And, and then he admitted about killing those guys uh, um, and told me that he didn't know why he did it. But he didn't know exactly what he'd done. And something inside of him was, was just broken because of his stupidity, drunkenness, whatever it was. He had that, that look kind of like a, you know, a beaten dog that comes back to be petted again. Somehow a fog seemed to have lifted in Gary's mind. For the first time, the consequences of his actions became clear to him. He said, I read the obituaries. They were young, they were missionaries and had young families. He said, I really feel bad. And he said, I ought to die for that. I said, do you want to die? And he said, do, do you want to die? And I said, no, I don't have any desire. And he said, I really don't either. But he said, I ought to for that. I'm afraid that I'd do it again. The state of Utah felt exactly the same way. In October 1976, Gary went on trial for murdering Ben Bushnell at the city center motel. It took the jury a little over an hour to convict him of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to death. The judge set November 15, 1976 as the date of execution. Gary Gilmore had only one more decision to make. Would he prefer to be shot or hanged? Gary said he would rather be shot. He thought a hanging could be more easily botched. His two attorneys tried to appeal the sentence, but Gary promptly fired them both and waived his right to a review of the case. His other option was spending the rest of his life behind bars, and that seemed to be quite unbearable. He had had a taste of being out for a length of time, and he couldn't go back anymore. He knew it. Despite Gary's wishes, a struggle was beginning between a legal system reluctant to mete out its own punishment and a killer hungry to accept it. Just three months before Gary's sentencing, the U.S. Supreme Court had laid down new guidelines for capital punishment. Gary Gilmore was about to be the first test of those new guidelines, and if he got his way, the first person executed in the United States in 10 years. Over the next few months, his story would make headlines around the world as he challenged the legal system to carry out his death sentence. When Gary Gilmore was sentenced to death in 1976, it became the media event of the year. Not only was it remarkable for someone to accept the punishment and express a desire to be put to death, but the United States had not executed anyone in 10 years. Suddenly, uh, every newspaper I picked up, every major magazine I picked up, had the face of my brother on it. And the worst aspects of our private history uh, were now uh, sensational news for the world. But for security reasons, officials at the Utah State Prison, where Gary was being held on death row, denied the press access to Gilmore. 
It turned into a, a somewhat of a media circus. One of uh, the networks uh, tried to land a helicopter in the uh, inmate recreation yard to get a better angle, hopefully to shoot through some windows into a cell area. We literally had to go to the FAA and get an air, uh, restricted airspace over the top of the institution. The prison was inundated with letters to Gary from Right to Life groups offering to help save him, others from supporters and admirers. Gary became a sex symbol. He had girls, 15, 14, and 18, writing him letters that from Hawaii won, and he great, could, took great delight in reading them. And they said, well, when you get out, uh, you know, we're going to do certain things. With the, uh, and they're very improper. I've probably got seven or 8,000 letters all over the world. Two girls from Honolulu wrote to me, they're 14. I'm philandered by all this shit. But if they knew me, they wouldn't love me. They're in love with a mother that's got his name in the paper every day. Nicole was doing her fair share of the writing as well. She and Gary were exchanging as many as three letters a day. His letters were very loving, lots of loving things. And I love yous, you know, that took up a whole page and, and a lot of cute little sketches. And uh, of course there was a lot of things about sex, what he liked to do, what he misses, you know, I mean, you know, typical man stuff. On November 15th, Gary's execution date came and went when the governor requested that the Utah Board of Pardons review the case. But Gary had prepared himself to die. He was ready and he wasn't going to do it alone. It was just natural to, to want to believe that, that if we both died, then, uh, you know, the distance, the, the prison walls, nothing could separate us. He never really even had to ask. And I don't know why, at that time in my life, uh, I was just very much in love with him. I figured if any two people ever really needed each other, truly needed each other, then we did. That afternoon, Nicole went to the prison to visit Gary. She was carrying 35 sleeping pills in a balloon which she hid in her vagina. There were another 35 at home for herself. She and Gary made a pact to take them at the same time. Both Nicole and Gary survived. Nicole was committed to a mental hospital, and after a few days, Gary was returned to prison. All contact between the two was forbidden, and Gary began a hunger strike in protest. The suicide pact added fuel to the media fire. TV networks in Hollywood were vying for the exclusive story. Through his uncle Vern, Gary made a deal with a film producer, Lawrence Schiller. I sold the rights to the book, the movie, and the state play, and the TV rights, and everything for 50000 I didn't know any better. I felt that the whole machinery of the situation in, uh, in, in terms of, of, uh, the, of many people involved in the legal process, many people involved in the commercial process, and many people involved in the media, I felt like there was this massive machine, this train, and the only place that that train could end up was when Gary died. And Gary was about to get another chance to fight for his death. On November 28th, he appeared with a new attorney before the Board of Pardons. It seems that uh, the people, especially the people of Utah, they want the... Uh, death penalty but they don't want executions and when it became a reality that they might have to carry one out well I started backing off on it well I took them literal and serious and they sentenced me to death I thought you were supposed to take them serious I didn't know it was a joke I would like them all including that group of reverends and rabbis from Salt Lake City to just butt out I don't think they uh, it's just my life and it's my death it's been sanctioned by the courts that I die and I accept that as far as uh, seeking anything from you, I don't. I'd like to reiterate that I probably don't deserve it either. Gary got his wish. The board decided to set a new date and carry out the execution. 
But with this latest victory came more obstacles. Gary's mother, Bessie, and numerous public interest groups filed for stays of execution. He didn't want a stay. He said he'd want to sit there for five years waiting for some beetle-headed judge to make up his mind. So, that's a quote. <laughs> On December 3rd, the U.S. Supreme Court granted a stay. Through the newspapers, Gary issued an open letter to his mother, asking her to kindly butt out. Bessie's legal action was short-lived. It was overturned after only 10 days. A day later, Gary appeared before the judge once again, and a new execution date was set for January 17th. But four weeks was too long for Gary Gilmore to wait. He had been stockpiling drugs in his cell, and that night he tried to take his life. And once again, he failed. Gary's brother, Michael, was still considering a last-ditch legal move. He flew to Utah and spent a few days visiting with his brother at the prison. On the way out, Gary offered him a T-shirt printed with a photo of Gary and the words, Gilmore, Death Wish. My little brother, Michael, come to see me. He said, Gary, I'm just frightened of you. I didn't know you. He said, now I met you, I like you. <laughs> yeah, I like him too. I love him. We had to talk on telephones, looking at each other through little teeny glass windows through a steel wall. He wanted to shake hands with me when we left. They told him, OK, if you'll go through a skin shake, I give him a kiss right on the cheek. <laughs> Michael left the prison having decided not to seek a stay of execution. I came to the conclusion that he really did want to die. And the, the life he had lived was hell, and the life he was going to live was hell. I decided the only thing I could do was let him find whatever uh, kind of rough redemption he found and stand aside and let it happen. It would be only days before the state of Utah would finish the job that Gary Gilmore had been unable to do on his own. At 6 p.m. on January 16, 1977, over 300 print and electronic media covering Gary Gilmore's execution were cordoned off in a prison parking lot where they would have to stay until after Gary's death the following morning. Protesters were allowed to demonstrate on the service road outside the gates. Behind the walls of Utah State Prison, Gary Gilmore was in rare form, happily spending his last night with friends and family. He really felt happy. He was dancing. He boxed with me. He was also receiving <laughs> medication, um, you know, pills. I have no idea what they were, but they were made him happy. I'll tell you that. They, they, I'm talking about handfuls. On top of the pills, Gary was also getting drunk. I put them in my pocket. I walked in. Took my coat off, laid it down. It's in the right-hand side of my coat pocket, Gary. Three of them. Oh, boy, I need that. So he went and got all three of them. Boy, they were gone almost immediately. Gary's attorney, Ron Stanger, surprised him by getting a call through to Gary's favorite musician, Johnny Cash. Johnny sang a song to him. And then Gary, of course, this time he's high as a kite, uh, tried to sing the song back, and it was, I mean, he could not carry a tune. <laughs> Don't be angry with me, darling, if I fail to understand all your little friends and wishes all the time. The party began to dwindle, and as people fell off to sleep, Gary made an audio recording for Nicole. Oh, baby, I love you. You're part of me. Man, I can't be anything without Nicole. If I didn't have you, wow, I'd go wild. Oh, baby, I want to be free of this planet. I just want you, too. Later that night, the American Civil Liberties Union managed to secure a last-minute stay of execution. A few hours later, uh, the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeal holds an emergency session in uh, Denver, Colorado, overturns that state. 
allows the execution to go forward, then we have to get the uh, sentencing judge out of bed in the early morning hours so that he can uh, issue a new uh, uh, sentence. So it was, you know, it was a very hectic kind of evening uh, managing Gilmore because even during that last 12, 14 hour period, we were on again and off again on two occasions. Here I am again. They're just going to close the door. Um, man, they just come and told me that uh, they still may execute me. Nicole, I want to be executed. I want to be dead. I want to be out of this shit. It's been a bum life. By 7.30 a.m., the execution was back on. Prison guards escorted Gary, Vern, Lawrence Schiller, Gary's lawyers, and two clergymen to an abandoned cannery behind the prison. Gary was loosely bound to a chair with padded nylon straps. He sat facing a gray muslin curtain only 25 feet away. There were five small openings for the rifles. A paper target was pinned over Gary's heart. Even in the last minutes of his life, Gary Gilmore showed no fear of death. Strapped to the execution chair, he jokingly offered to arm wrestle his uncle. He says, let me try you just one more time. Oh, Gary, I can pull you right out of that chair. And he says, would you? He ran at the last minute, he's still joking. I was the last one to uh, see him, and, and I was terribly emotional. I mean, I was in shock. And I went over and, uh, you know, gave him a hug. We were all lined up in a half circle, and... Uh, A black corduroy hood was placed over Gary's head. When they shot, I looked over and I seen that blood come out of his shirt. And it runs slowly, very slowly, and it was almost black, down his shirt and just dripped on the floor. I would like to say at this time that Gary, my nephew, he died like he wanted to die, in dignity. When I talked with him in the wee hours of the morning, he did express thanks for many of the things that happened to him, and he expressed sorrow for the deeds that he did. I went out to my mother's uh, trailer where she was living because I wanted to be with her at the time that happened. Somebody brought in the newspaper right before right before it was supposed to happen, and the execution had been stayed uh, overnight. Turn on TV, and and, uh, and, the, and the news flashing across the bottom of the screen was that the execution had just taken place. That morning, Nicole was still being treated at the mental hospital following her suicide attempt. All of a sudden, I saw his face. It came up, and it was contorted with pain. I mean, it just jumped up at me. It just scared me. And then the doctor came in right after that and said that Gary had just been shot. Immediately after Gary's execution, most of his organs were donated for transplant. His body was cremated and the ashes sprinkled by plane over Spanish Fork, Utah, the small town in which he and Nicole had lived together so briefly. The $50,000 from the sale of Gary's life story was divided among family members. Some of the money was given to the wives of the two men he had murdered. The day after the execution, the national and international press packed up and returned home, having created a mythical figure out of a lonely and pathetic killer. It was bizarre. It was a circus. They took a lot of it out of context and made it into something it wasn't. Everything was for sale. There was a price on everything, your privacy, uh, souvenirs, bits and pieces. Uh, it, it was... It was horrible. It really was. Gary basked in the limelight while he could. By challenging the system to carry out the punishment it had imposed, he was finishing the battle that had begun with his father's abuse more than 30 years earlier. In a strange way, Gary Gilmore had won a victory. He referred to a passage uh, from, from Nietzsche, the paraphrasing which goes that there must come a time in man's life when, when he is willing to arise and meet the history of his moment. 
And I think that was part of what Gary saw. Here was a way not to die in anonymity. Here was a way to die with some kind of a, a conquest. It was also a, a way to die that would turn the screws on, on the system of authority that he had come to hate and resist and fight against so, so much. But it was a victory that was costly to others. Gary Gilmore managed Max Jensen and Ben Bushnell, the two hardworking young men who died at his hands. They're completely lost. Their families and their loved ones are completely lost in the, in the history, the 20-year history of Gary Gilmore. And that's, that's a real tragedy. It's a tragedy for us as a nation. It's a tragedy for us as individuals that we ought to uh, hang our hat on the Gary Gilmores of the world and forget about the Jensens and Bushnells. It's tragic. Gilmore's status as a symbol was inevitable. His execution paved the way for the hundreds that have followed since Gilmore uttered his unforgettable phrase, let's do it. There was a way in which, with Gary, a certain kind of modern history began, the, the, the history of uh, increasing lack of, of willingness to look at how uh, violence and murder happened in our lives and try to comprehend it. We are at a point where we don't want to look at those things and, uh, and understand them. We are at a point where we want to uh, shut those things out and punish them. And, 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 the, and the worst result of all is that because of that, uh, that approach, that increased desire for punitive measure, we will see a, a world in which there are many more Gary Gilmore's than we would ever like to imagine. You walked home with her every night for years dreaming of the moment. The moment science would lead you to him and you could finally let her go. Cold Case Files. Next on A&E.